Okay, but what a lot of people might not realise is when your spotlight writers have finished analysing the race, they have to price it up and the probable SP is their work. So where on earth do you start when pricing up a race? First thing, again, as I said, when it comes to tipping horses, you've got to find out what the favourite is and then you frame the race around it. Um, you've obviously got to build in the bookmaker's profit margin, but you know if you if you if you can find a favourite and a second favourite, then the, the rest you'll you'll find yourself. It is not easy, uh, and a lot of people, you know, you do get the occasional criticism of a of a racing post spotlight. Um, you have to remember that these guys are doing sixty horses a day, and they're doing sixty words for sixty horses, and another sentence for 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 the app. Uh, and you know, so they're knocking out the best part of four thousand words a day and doing SP forecasts. I, I actually think they do a remarkable job uh, uh, with their SP forecasts and, and and the spotlights themselves. And but you know, the the one golden rule is you have to find a favourite first. So would you price up originally to a hundred percent and then try and work around? Well, I was I was always told that. But I mean, if you price up a book to a hundred percent, ninety percent of the time you're not going to find a bet. Because, especially when you're talking 16 mile handicaps, they can be betting to 130. I think you have to be realistic. Um, I'm, you know, I'm somebody who's looking to have a bet, not looking to find the one point um, that that's wrong in the in the 500 races that you're doing. Like, you know what I mean? So, so yeah. I mean, if you want to do it to 100 percent, do it to 100 percent. But most of the time, you'll end up you'll end up not having a bet. Sorry to keep labouring the point here. So you find the favourite and then you sort of look for two or three that have got realistic chances of beating it and split it up between them and then... Yeah, exactly. You, you like build it around it and then the other ones become obvious. Well, this is this is a quite an outsider now, isn't it? Like, you know what I mean? Here's the favourite. Here's one, two, three, four dangers uh, and the rest. And then, you know, you build it in. You know what I mean? If you've got a rag that's trained by John Gosden, it's a shorter price than a rag that is trained by Joe Blocks. You know what I mean? So you've got, you know, there, there are ways to, to work it out. But... Um, you know, you have to start. You have to start with a favourite. Get your pecking order, uh, and then you can look at how strong the rest is, and then you you have an idea of how big they're going to be, and then you have to build them build the margins backwards. Okay, would you agree with the, the common sort of philosophy now that Betfair sorts out the true price by the off? By the off, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, look, the, the, the vast majority of, uh, of of Betfair action is in the last five or ten minutes these days, anyway, isn't it? You know, what I mean, the markets are not particularly liquid in the morning, overnight, or, or even an hour before the race. But come, come, come the final few minutes, you'll see some big moves. A lot of big punters, of course, can't get on uh, with traditional bookies, uh, so they're waiting. Um, there's no point in throwing their hand away early when there's no money around. Uh, so that's when that's when you get big moves. I mean, we have people. Uh, people might say that you know it's not straight. Look at the money for this. Look at this big drifter coming. It is just literally waste weight of money. From really good punters who know what they're doing. Okay, so if you price the race up and then the exchanges differ wildly from what you uh, sort of thought of the race, would you put that down to their better judgment, or would you? I know. In a rat a bit? No, I think you've got to. I think you have to be confident in your own ability uh, because you would half be sick if you're right and you decided not to have a bet. That's that. That's the important thing. Like you know, I always say to people. I'm quite happy when everybody else disagrees with me because I've got a far better chance of making money then. If everyone agrees with me, you're not going to get the right price. So, you know, never, ever, ever be afraid of a price just because the market doesn't fancy it and you do. It's a really, really stupid thing to do because you can miss big price, you can miss decent price winners just because you're scared that you're wrong. I mean, that's daft. Okay, so you wrote a book on the exchanges got one about 10 years ago now, I think. How do you feel now? Are they a good or bad thing? Uh, no, no, I like the exchange. I like the exchange from punting. I mean, you know, I don't you. I don't really use. I don't really use them for racing um, seriously. Um, I, I like to. I like to. Most of my betting tends to be anti-post five days uh, before the race. You know, on a Monday night when all the markets are priced up. That's what. That's when I like to do it. Obviously, I think you've got fantastic each. You know, if you can get on, you have fantastic each way terms every single every single Saturday nowadays uh, with the main bookmakers. They really are. They're fighting for your money. If you know, again, it, you know, it's one of those. You can say it's never been a better time. It's never been a better time to be a mug punter because you can get on and you can get great value, and you'll lose your money much slower than you used to twenty years ago. But if you're any good, you're going to struggle. Uh, and 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 then it's and then it's bet fair for you with um, win only in traditional place terms. Um, I I like the exchanges. I like punting on them. I like watching the markets. Um, I don't think they're a bad thing. I mean, obviously. 
some bad things have happened with you know people laying horses etc but you know the, the, a lot of them have been caught and nobody was ever caught before that's interesting you say that because one of the things you do know is I used to go to Camden a lot um, big drifters on the all weather low grade races that they suddenly fall out of the stalls and they hit some terrible bad luck after they've drifted remarkably do you think that horse racing cracks down on that sort of thing enough or is it just really punters remembering those days uh, look you know we have seen in the past that uh, uh, there have been you know a few shady characters and uh, a, a, a few people laying laying horses to lose and things like that going on. I think it's probably straighter than most people think it is. Uh, but you know, any any sport in which there is money being traded and you can bet on it, and the money, uh, the prize money itself is so low, then it, you know, it is going it is going to attract people. Uh, you know, it's going to attract Romans basically. Like, you know what I mean? But I think it's, it, I think it's straighter than most people think. And I do think the vast majority of big drifts are simply market corrections. Good punters betting with their opinions. You know, and if something comes in, something else has got to go out. So it's only, you think only the punters only remember when... Of course they do. I've backed loads of drifters and loads of them have lost and I thought to myself, oh, what went on there? This is a bit... This is a bit wrong. This, but then I backed a few that have won, and I thought, "Well, I'm clever." You know what I mean? You only, you only, you know, you get a bad taste in your mouth when something goes wrong, right? You know. But I mean, not you know, you know. I think there was a study done a few years ago where, if you backed all the horses that that had come in by a certain percentage, you'd be far worse off than if you'd backed all the horses had gone out by a certain percentage. Like you know what I mean? Drifters do win. Okay, given punters, you know, people that are aspiring to improve their punting, a lot of good information, good advice here. Now, do you think that if they were, would you advise anyone to specialise on like all weather racing? If you want to, yeah. <laughs> it's not something that it's not something that I'm going to do. It's sort of grown on me over the years. Um, yeah, you know, when I first when I first saw all weather racing, I just saw it as betting shop fodder, low class stuff, which would bore me if it was on grass. To be honest, uh, a lot of it is a lot better than that now. Particularly, um, Chelmsford put on some really really good racing. Uh, and and there's, you know, there is good racing at, at, at all the tracks at times. There, I'll be happy with it. Some people do. I do know that some people are looking. Uh, some people really, really specialise at Southern, and I wouldn't even turn my telly on for Southern. Uh, you know, but you know, if you can do it and it interests you, and you can, if you know, anything that can give you an edge, then yeah, do it. Just talking. Just going back briefly to your um, sort of. When did you suddenly discover that you had a talent for picking winners? I was, it, 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 it was strange really because I, I promise you I, I spent a good 20 years being a complete mug punter I mean, I, you know I just liked having a bet like you know and I you know, I didn't really mind losing I'm not you know uh, I'm not the most disciplined man in the world never will be um, I had a mate who used to be the deputy sports editor um, here years ago and he went to Australia and he kept asking me for for tips for Cheltenham and Royal Ascot and stuff like that and I'd send him a brief preview and I was giving him loads of winners and it, it surprised even me. And um, then when I took over, uh, I got the title of betting, betting editor. It was literally just a production job, looking after all the other tipsters and, and drawing up pages. So I wasn't doing any tipping at all. Uh, I started standing in for people. I then asked, I then got asked to stand in for the weekender um, a couple of times. Then Matt Williams, who did the weekender, left. And then they asked me to do it full time. And I got hate mail. I started, I started okay in the first jump season in 2010, but the flat season of 2011 was embarrassing. I mean, it was terrible. I barely, barely had a winner. The losses were like, you know, 30%, I think, overall, 35%, I think it was. And then the 2011-12 jump season uh, was the complete opposite. I, mean, I, I, I was just going back to have a look at my figures because I've never, I've never really kept a record of the weekend. Um, hard to do because you get loads of non-runners when there's no markets and they don't count. But I looked at it, and the profit for the 2011-12 season was more than 100%. And I, even I was staggered by that. I knew I'd had a really good good year that year. I'll be interested to see whether I've made any profits uh, over the next few years. I'm in profit in 2018. I can tell you that. Um, but the rest, I don't know. I just it just suddenly fell into place. I I, I really enjoy looking at racing. I mean, it all boils down to me. Do you have an awful lot of sympathy for punters that can't really be bothered and just copy you? I want to say sympathy. Um, well, when they're having a go at you, I mean, you know. Oh, no, 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 people have a go. I mean, there are people who expect you to 
tip winners all the time, even though you're tipping 10, 12, 20 to one shots, etc. Um, that's just silly. You get lots of people who have a dig and, you know, I mean, it, like sometimes I will amuse myself by winding them up on Twitter. Other times I'll just, I'll just block them. Um, you know, you've got some really, really decent people out there who just like the fact that here you are presenting them a case. You give them a good read. I like to give them a good read as well. Like, you know what I mean? Not just say back this. I hate the idea that I just give you one sentence. I fancy this. Go away and back it. I just want to say, here's why. Um, if you agree with it, please back it. If you don't, please come to your own conclusion. Back something else. And if I'm wrong, I really do hope you win. I like to see punters win. I like to hope that I've helped some win at some of the time. And I like to think that when I'm on a losing run, they've jumped ship a lot, a lot earlier than I have myself. You know what I mean? So, you know, I mean, I just like, I, I like to see people win. I like to think that I can give them some sort of help. And, you know, at least say, look, this is the way I look at it. Try and do it yourself. See what you can come up with. So one of the success stories of the racing post in the past has been price-wise. Now, do you think price-wise is still viable in the world as 24-hour betting? It would be a crying shame to get rid of the brand because it's you know it was brilliant since its inception in 19 I think it was 1987 the first price wise column ever came out and um, but the problem is bookmakers no longer hold the prices we've already we already made the decision a, a year and a half ago to no longer tip at prices in the paper uh, because those prices aren't there anymore when people go down the shop and pick up you know the, there are two or three firms who will guarantee for you know five minutes, I think one of those only guarantees the price-wise selection. Uh, and you can't really blame bookmakers for that either because you know when, when the race of postal started, there wasn't any evening opening, there wasn't any internet. They just got up in the morning and their prices that they'd set at 6 p.m. went live at 10, 10 o'clock in the morning. Nowadays, it's you know those t prices are traded all week. Uh, the decks are made on a Thursday. They're, they're priced up by, you know, most races are priced up by, by Friday morning then as well for, for Saturday. Uh, and they're traded all day. How can you expect them to say, right, we're finishing this horse at 14 to 1 at 5.30 on a Friday when we've got to, when we've got to set the paper and uh, get it off to print and, you know, it's going to go down to 8 to 1 by 8 p.m. but we're going to put it back out at 14 to 1 in the morning. We can't, it can't happen anymore. So I think, I think price-wise, you know, maybe, maybe we should put the prices out first off when they go at 8 p.m. but then they're not live for very long. What do you do then? People are still going to be looking at it uh, at midnight, at uh, six o'clock the next morning, and we're saying back this at 12 to one, and it'll show seven to one on the on the bet link. So it, it, it's hard. Uh, I think it, I think it's worth still carrying tables to show people how people how the bookmakers were betting. Um, but the best thing you can do now is get on at the best price you can, and just you, but you cannot uh, expect prices that have been there overnight to still be there in the morning anymore. Would there be a case for putting the minimum price for value? There is a case for that, but the problem, the problem I find with that is how do you record it? You say, get on at 10 to 1, say, so, right, well it was 10 to 1 at one stage and then it wins. You think, do I, take, do I, do I write that down as 10 to 1 when I'm, when I'm recording the figures? I don't, see, I don't see how you can. Did people get the 10 to 1? Did people, you know, it's now 8 to 1 now, half the people that you've tipped it to are now not going to back it. So, you know, I, I think the only thing we can do is keep our own records at SP uh, and tell people to get on at the best price they can. Now, SP makes it virtually impossible for anybody to make a decent profit. Uh, so it is not the fairest way for to judge any tipsters. It's, it's very difficult because, you know, if you're tipping in a 20 runner race at SP, there's a 30%, maybe more, you know, Grand National 50% margin in favour of the bookmakers. How are you expected over time to keep beating that and make a profit? Um, I made a tiny one in 2017, an even smaller one so far in 2018, on the brink of on the brink of going into the red as we speak. Um, so it, it, it is very difficult. If if it was Betfair SP, we could do that. Don't know how fair that is either. It'd be interesting to know what people think. If it was Betfair SP, my PL this year would be nearly 20%, which I think is adequate. Um, but it's a lot different at SP. I just think the only way you could do it at SP, but we're never going to be able to be that bullish about big numbers anymore. Okay, you mentioned um, the racing post going to print. Now, is it always going to be going to print or is it going to go online solely, do you think? I think there'll be a time in the future when all newspapers are digital only. I don't think there are any, any immediate or, or, or even long-term plans for the racing post to go that way. It did, it, 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 that sort of thing is way above my pay grade anyway. I certainly wouldn't have heard anything about it. 
But you know, you look at the way you go. All every newspaper in the country, you know, around the world is losing uh, losing uh, readers to online. That's where people are going. Um, the older people that you know, what I mean, the, the, you know, the generations that read papers are dying off, uh, and now everybody goes to, to digital. So at some point, I think all papers will go that way. I hope hope it is not in my lifetime, but uh, you never know. Okay, and finally. A golden rule for an aspiring form student like yourself. Oh, golden rule: discipline. Be more disciplined than I am. You'll do a blue, you'll do a hell of a lot better. <laughs> that's, that's about all I can say. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you haven't got discipline, if you, if you know, if you can be a clown with money like I can, uh, then you're going to struggle. But I mean, you know, just, just, you know, if you want to take it seriously, you've got to be disciplined. Paul Keeler, thank you very much. No worries.